Warning, the following content provided by this documentary may be disturbing for some audiences. Some images are disturbing and graphic and not for the faint of heart. This is Ivan Jani and his story about surviving the Holocaust and the impact the Holocaust had on the world and Europe. Thanks. The size of the Holocaust was so tremendous just to explain the largest massacre of peoples that ever happened to civilians in the United States was on the 9th of the 11th, when 2,997 people were killed. My name is Ivan Jarni. I was born in 1924 in an absolute superb country right in the center of Europe called Czechoslovakia. I was born in the Slovak part, which adjoined the Polish border. The country was totally democratic, multicultural. We had a lot of Germans, Hungarians. Uh, in a population of 15 million, there were two and a half million Germans. There were 90,000 Jews. There were one million Hungarians. The, my, those minorities did not like each other but because the country was totally democratic and everybody had all the rights, we all lived in relative good uh, relationships. Hitler hated the Czechs because they were willing to fight him and they were very well armed and they were highly industrialized. There were lots of factories which he needed for his rearming. He loved the Slovaks. For one reason, there was a political party run by a man called Dr. Josef Tiso, who was a fascist, who admired Hitler, who liked everything that Hitler was doing and kept visiting him. And Hitler, in those, on those visits, told him that he was going to destroy Czechos Czechoslovakia, but that he would separate the Czechs from the Slovaks and that he would give Slovakia independence as long as they did what Hitler wanted them to do. Well, the president of Slovakia said, that's fantastic, yes. Uh, what I want you to do for me is get rid, get rid of the Jews. I hate the Jews, get rid of them. And Hitler said, well, I'll get rid of them, but it will cost you money. We, we all lived under this terrible threat that we can be deported. And the president clearly said to us, only those Jews who are necessary for our government and for the war effort will stay. The others will be deported. Now, my father had a school friend who at that time still had a large leather factory. And in that leather factory they were making things for the German army, like saddles for their horses, harnesses and various other things. And my dad got me a job there that was in a near, nearby town, about 80 kilometers from where we were. And I went there and I became apprentice there. And there were several other Jewish people who were also working there. My father's friend, because he was working for the war and for the German army, he, he was protected from, from being deported. People like that were being saved, those who were necessary for the war effort. I did not trust them. I knew it was going to finish up somehow or other. I had premonitions that this will be very bad for us. Well, the president called that parliament and kept making Jewish laws for the next two years. In total, he made 255 anti-Jewish laws he passed. They were all meant to denigrate us, humiliate us, and dehumanize us. As I said to you, the worst one was that Jews can be removed from the territory of Slovakia. It was something terrible. Then came things like, you can't go to school. Okay, I, was, I, I settled that. Then came other things. If you had a business, 
you had to take a person whom the fascists appointed, teach him everything that you knew, and the moment the non-Jew, that means they used to call them Aryans, the moment the Aryan thought that he knew how to run this business, the Jew was no longer protected, he was thrown out, and he was also subject to deportation. The next one was, two weeks later, Jews can no longer associate with Aryans. That means my friends stopped greeting me and it became, I became very isolated. The next one was Jews cannot intermarry, no matter what. The next thing came another two weeks. I'm talking now of what happened in the next two years. Jews can no longer own any bicycles, any motorcycles, nor cars. My uncle had a car, uh, my dad had a motorcycle. The guard took it and that was it. Another law came into being two weeks later. The Jews can have no longer cameras. They may photograph military objects and become traitors. So we gave the cameras. The next thing was Jews can no longer own passports. So the, uh, you lost your passport and the ability to remove yourself from the country. Another law came, Jews cannot enter picture theaters. Now I can tell you that for me, that was a real punishment. I loved the pictures, I had the money. Me and my Jewish friends, we were standing in an alcove behind the projection room and were listening to the soundtrack. And we were trying to work out afterwards what did the people see, the ones that were inside the picture theaters. It's so dehumanizing, you, you feel so low. I mean, you're trying to guess what, what the film was all about. You only, knew the, you only heard the soundtrack. Finally, on the 25th of March, 1942, the first deportation happened. The government asked the, for the Jews to provide 999 girls, ages 16 till 38, single girls, and told them, bring 40 kilograms of all that you need because you'll be going to Germany. Don't panic. They wanted to avoid panic at all time, at all cost. You will go to Germany and you will work in field lazarets or in hospitals because the German girls are working on the front. And after three or four months, you shall be coming back. And really, everybody believed it. How could anybody believe that you will be taken into, Pol not into Germany, but Poland, and you'll be killed there? Well, what happened then was the girls had to appear on, it was a Thursday, and I saw them, they were marched into an old military barrack where they spent the night, and next morning, next morning, there was a long li line of uh, railway cars, all for, all for the transport of cattle, not for people. They were kettle cars. On each kettle car was written eight horses or 60 persons. And they took those girls with their suitcases, the, pushed them into the kettle cars. There were no ramps. The girls had to climb and they were well dressed and they were nice girls and they weren't very despondent because they really believed they'll be coming back in three months time although some parents came and some mothers cried because the girls had never been outside, I mean, 16-year-old girls outside their home or their city. Anyway, next morning, they loaded the girls. They had to climb into those wagons. The wagon doors closed, left, and we never saw them again. My father had a cousin, a very smart guy, his name happened to be Otto. And Otto said to my father and to me, he said, look, he said, you are protected. But uh, we are protected by the Slovaks. The Germans will attack 
Poland, and they had detected by them, because I'm turning oct October 17, September into Poland, and he said they will maybe, probably they will attack Russia as well, and they will be beaten. There is no way that a Germany can fight the whole world. You have got England, you've got the great Soviet Union against you, uh, against Hitler, and America may also come, like in the First World War. They will be beaten, and they don't have enough petrol, and they don't have enough iron. It may take a long time, but they will come back and kill you all then, because they, you are not protected from them, You're pre or by the Germans. You are protected by the Slovaks. My father said, well, what should we do? And Otto said, build bunkers, hideouts. I was a... I knew those forests and I knew the mountains as well because that was my hobby, hiking in the mountains and going with the scouts. We found a place, we went there and we cut some trees, we removed the foliage, we built little bunkers and uh, Otto said, well, you've got to stock them with food. So we stocked them with food, we tried to wrap the food so it wouldn't get lost. We hid it under foliage, under the banks, and we thought we were happy and successful. We kept going there at the weekends, which was always a four-minute, four-hour walk through the mountains and through the forests. And one day we found that somebody had discovered it and had looted all our food. We told this to Otto, and Otto said, you've got to go higher. You've got to go past the snow line, which is 1,600 meters. You've got to go into caves. You, there are caves in the mountains. You will find a cave which will not be too wet, because most caves were very damp or totally even wet. And you will find yourself a cave where you will be able to hide. And this is what we did. We did find a cave. And then, according to what Otto said, we started to stock it again. Now, it was easy to stock things like uh, sardines. It was easy to stock oil in cans. It was easy to stock ge vegetables, gems, and so on in tins. But you need things which must never get wet. Matches, candles. If a wick gets wet, just damp, it will never burn, no matter how much wax it has got. You need flour. Flour ne needs to be packed dry. Anyway, my mother was very resourceful. She found a way because plastic had not been invented by that time. And she found a way of packing things in impregnated cloths with wax. And we took all these things into the bunkers. We made little bunks to sleep on hid the food under the banks and closed the entrance to the caves with big boulders. And we really thought we are safe. On one of my trips to the bunkers which we had built, to the caves which we were hoping to spend, to be saved from the Germans, I came across two men who looked military but were dressed in civilian clothes. I heard, as they came closer, I found out that they spoke Russian. Russian is very similar to, a Slo to Slovakian, and by and large I understood what they were talking. And I asked them who they were, and he, he said to me, one of them said to me, you first. I said, well, we are Jewish people, and we are looking here for caves, I didn't tell them that we already had found a cave to hide because the Germans may be coming on the, and retreat from Russia, on their retreat from Russia. <clears throat> I said, who are you? He said, we are military officers of the Red Army. We were airdropped into your territory. We're here to prepare an uprising and to make it as painful for the Germans as what they have done to our country. As you know, we have beaten the Germans at Stalingrad. A hundred thousand of them were taken into, as prisoners into Siberia, 
and we killed another 100,000. Their southern front will be retreating through Slovakia. So we need to find people who will be on our side. And we also need to have the conditions ripe where people will join us in an uprising which we are planning to, to, to do. I said, well, I knew of some people in the villages and at night time I took these Russian people to meet those Slovaks which were on their side. They were against Hitler. And these people gave them food and the Russians were quite happy and I visited their bunkers several times later on and I found that almost every night some more Russians were dropped by parachutes to join them. The uprising in Slovakia started in August 1944. I heard about it and I took my family into the cave which I prepared for them. And that was my mother, who was 41 years old, my sister, who was 14 years old, my uncle, my auntie, and their six-year-old boy, who, my cousin. And I also took one of my friends, the one that taught me how to make saddles. He was, he, he, he was one of my very best friends all my life. I settled them in the cave and kept going and uh, meeting the Russians. And one day I met two terribly bedraggled men. They looked something shocking and they were screaming, Dupin, Dupin, nous avons faim, we are hungry, we are starving, we need bread. I inter introduced myself and I said, who are you? And they we are French people. I said, how did you come to Slovakia? They told me they were taken prisoners of war in 1940 when Hitler destroyed France and that they were sent as slave laborers into an ammunition factory not very far from where I met them, about a hundred kilometers. The partisans had freed them, but they were now without food and without language and they were totally lost in the forests and they need food. Well, I said, I can't help you. Do you have a leader? And they said, yes. And they took me to their, it wasn't a cave, it was more like a bunker, where I met a man, Captain de la Nurienne was his name, George de la Nurienne, who was a military officer and who was an absolvent of the highest military school in Europe at that time, it was Saint Cyr. And again, he told me they have to eat, and I, I had to reply, I really cannot help you. But I know of the Russians who are here. Maybe the Russians will help you. So I took Captain de la Nurienne and his second in command, about eight or nine kilometers away into the Russian bunker, Russian cave. And there I introduced them to Colonel Vielichko, who was the leader of all the Russian partisans. By that time, they were quite a group. And uh, Velichko says, what do they want from me? I said, well, they want food. He says, yeah, and what are they willing to do for it? And I asked De La Nurienne, and De La Nurienne said, look, he said, Germany occupied us, they destroyed us, we are their enemies, we want to fight on your side. But we need food. And Velichko says, now you're talking. And I thought, I saw to myself, I've done my duty. I'm going back to live in the bunker where my family was. And Velichko says, no, 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 no. He says, I, we need you here. You speak both languages, you're the only one. Well, I went back to the bunker and told my mom, mom, I've got to leave you. Velichko said not only that he needs me, but he also said he expects me to do my duty in the war as well to be on their side and do something. And at the moment, I help you with food, which I get in scrounge from the Russians, because the Russians made forays into the villages at night. And maybe with the French now, 
there will be more food because they too will be going into the villages to get food. Well, mom very reluctantly agreed and this was happened. My family stayed in the bunker. I supplied them with food whenever I could and visited them, but I spent my days between the Russian and the, and the French bunkers or caves. I, I, I have to tell you what happened in the bunkers. My, my mom was very, very unhappy. They had the basic food, but they couldn't wash. There was nowhere to wash. It was in the middle of the snow. They had no, no wash basins. My mom had developed a bad eczema on her thighs and on the inside of her arms, which was very itchy. You couldn't make a fire because if, the, if you made a fire, a smoke would give you away. The Germans or the fascists would come and blow up the bunker, which they did. Many people took the risks. The only time you could make a fire was when there was heavy fog or when it was snowing. You cannot imagine. You could not, could not go to the toilet. The toilet was, you had to walk uphill through heavy snow 20 meters behind your cave and do relieve yourself there. Can you imagine my mom, 41 years old, trudging through half a meter of snow? My six-year-old cousin had to be carried and toilet paper. It was so, so degrading, so difficult for them to live, to live there. And mom came to me and she said one day, she said, look, I would give anything Find us a place where we can live for a few days like your normal people, human people, where I can wash. And I said, I will try. And I knew a forester. His house was the last house in a village called Ilanovo. And I went to him and I said to him, listen, you are on our side. I know you help us with food and so on. He says, would you put up my family and my friend for a few nights, he said, I'll put up your family. I took my family there and said to my mom, Mom, I'm coming next morning. That was in the winter of 1944, incredible cold, and I'll bring my own dirty wash because I would like you to wash my... And she said, of course, my boy. So I, next morning, I crammed everything I had into my knapsack I went through the mountains down, through the forest, and the forest was about 60, 70 meters from the forester's house. This was the last house in the village. And I said, I will watch and see if there is any Germans in the village, but there were no Germans. Everything was very quiet. So I approached the back gate, and as I approached it, the gate opens, Two Germans in white uniform are standing there, barking at me, Reinkommen Papiere vorweisen. Come in and show us your papers. I don't know what made me do it, but I turned around and started to run with my knapsack on my back. And they started to shoot. I cannot tell you, I felt and heard the the, the bullets whistled past me, and all of a sudden I was thrown face forward into the snow. I thought I have been hit and I'm, or maybe killed. But then I wiggled around and I saw, no, I'm okay. And I looked back and I saw the German shouldering his gun and coming towards me. Something made me to get up. I unbuttoned my coat, threw my coat and my knapsack down and started to run. And he started to scream, bring the hunde, bring the hunde, bring the dogs. There was a little brook running through the, from the, from the forest to where I was. And I ran into that brook. There was very little water, icy cold and slippery stones. I jumped from stone to stone to stone and ran for my life into the deep forests. Now I have to tell you what happened to my family. They were all cold, and also my friend. My mom and 
under guard they were taken into the next town which was called Mikulash, which means Nicholas. There they were put into jail and eight days later they were deported. My mom and my sister were sent to one of the worst concentration camps for women called Ravensbrück in Germany, where my mom two weeks later was murdered by a Dr. Fritz Klein. My sister somehow was sent on to a death march to another concentration camp called Bergen-Belsen on foot. She was in a dreadful state, not only because she had lost her mom, but also because she was sick. She had developed typhoid and she weighed, weighed 38 kilos. She couldn't keep any food down. My uncle and my auntie and my little cousin were taken into a what they called Sammellager into Theresienstadt, which was, a, was not a camp of annihilation. They didn't kill people there, but they let old people die of hunger because there was no food. Anyway, this is what happened to my family. And as I told you, I was running after the Germans had shot at me and ran as fast as I could. I came into another village, no Germans there. I knew a family called Yurechka, and the village was called Poruba. I went into Poruba, I jumped, went over the back fences, jumped, and went into the house of the Yurechkas, and I was totally puffed out and told them that I'd lost my family, and what happened to me, that I'd been shot at. And uh, Mrs. Yurechka, Susanna, said, look, don't worry, don't worry, it's not so bad, something will happen, there is no Germans here, F sit down. And she brought me warm, clean socks, which I put on. She made me a warm soup, and I'm spooning the soup. And as I'm spooning the soup, I'm looking through the window, and I see the Germans marching into that village as well. You cannot imagine, I said, listen, I'm a Jew. I've got a gun on me. I had my pistol, and I'm a partisan. When they catch me here, I have to get out let me get back into the forest because all of us will be shot. And uh, Jan said, you're not going anywhere. He took me up to the loft and he had built a secret room in the loft and he told me to climb in through an opening and said to me, stay very, very still. So I stayed there, took off my shoes and looked around. It was a room about two by three meters very small. There was a mattress filled with straw on the floor. There was a table, a small table on which there was a New Testament. There was a, a sewing machine in the corner. There was a half of a smoked pig hanging from the rafters on a hook. And there were two buckets. One bucket was filled with water and the other bucket was empty. I took off my shoes, sat there very quietly and tried to work out about the buckets. And I worked out that the second bucket must be my toilet. And I used it. I sat there very, very quietly and read the New Testament, which I'd never read before. And I heard the Germans in the house screaming, Alte Hexe, gib uns was zu essen. Old witch, give us something to eat or we will eat you. And they were carrying on and drinking, but around 10, 10, 30, 11 at night, they got quiet, they started to sleep. And around midnight, I hear scratching on the roof, and Jan Jurechka was outside, on his side of the loft. He brought me fresh water, he brought me soup, he brought me bread, he brought me a knife so I could cut myself some ham from the pork, from the pig, and he took my toilet bucket. Now you cannot imagine the danger that that man was in. The toilets were behind the house. If one of the Germans in the, in the uh, staying there would have seen him with the toilet, he knew the game would have been up. He knew that Yurechka is hiding somebody. Everybody would have been there, would have found us, would have found me, and they would have killed everybody. Somehow or other, lucky old Ivan, I was lucky and nobody woke up. And he did that for three nights. 
I was there three nights. On the fourth morning, he comes and he quite loudly says, the Germans have retreated. They're out of the village. You can get out. So I got out. I thanked him from the bottom of my heart for saving my life and said, I'm going back to the partisans to do my job. Liaison men between the Russians. And he says, you wouldn't find them. The Germans have retreated about 25 kilometers and they, the Russians are now following them and they are in a town called Ruzomberok. I said, well, I'll find Ruzomberok. He says, you wouldn't because they're in the forest. I know it. So he took me there. And I resumed my work with the, as, as a liaison man, but the Germans were retreating. Every time their ammunition ran out, the longest stand that they made was one month. They stood at a town called Liptovsky Hradok, where they were sh skirmishes. They were every day shooting at us and we were shooting at them. They killed and wounded quite a few of ours, and I think we killed quite a few of theirs too. But then the ammunition ran out, they retreated five, six kilometers. Then there was another stand, maybe just two weeks later on, they were just one week. This is how it went on for a few months. It's, I'm talking already in 1945. In, 19, in May 1945, the Russians put us into a train because they said the Germans are now retreating so fast, you will, we will follow them by train. And that train had stopped at a town called Brno, a large town where the Bren gun was developed in the First World War. So very big town, half a million people or a million people, big Skoda works there already in those years. I'm sitting in the, in the train with my Papa Shah, that they call, the Papa Shah is the automatic Russian, Russian gun with a round The one that holds a uh, no magazine. magazine that holds uh, bullets, 98 bullets. I'm sitting there and I'm holding my gun because you never were permitted to put a gun into a onto a hook or a, it always had to be at your hands reach. And I'm bored like hell. It was a beautiful day, and some of the Russians and some of the French took off their shirts and they climbed up onto the wagon to sunbake themselves. And I'm bored, I'm looking, and I see those Russians coming out, hopscotching, jumping, screaming something. I couldn't work out what, what, what. And as they came closer, I hear them screaming, Kanyets Vaini, the end of the war. I cannot tell you that's like uh, what they did to me. First of all, I couldn't understand it. I didn't, I knew the war was coming to an end, but I didn't know it may take another year, six months, five weeks, who knows? I never expected it to be so sudden. And the Russians came into the wagon. And what, ha what, what happened then you, is hard to describe. They were kissing each other. They were dancing. They were singing. They were screaming. They were hollering. They were drinking. And some of them, forgetting that there are people on the roof, started to shoot bursts of their automatic. And I hear, this is the end of the war, I hear stoi, 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 which in Russian means stop. And we could hear wounded soldiers falling, rolling off the floor and falling onto the railway track. I said to myself, this is not for me, I don't want to die the day the, the war finished. And I grow, got out with my gun and I started to walk back to where we had come from, that means towards the east. I walked for a long, long time, don't, know how, don't remember how, and I found a little railway station with a waiting room, a disused, very small. I went into that uh, uh, waiting room, I sat down and I said to myself, I've got to, I've got to work out, I'm free. This is the end of the war, yes, I'm free. Millions of thoughts went through my mind. What am I going to do? What happened to my mom? How am I going to find where they took my mom, my sister, my family, my friends? 
how will I live? I have was thrown out of school. Can I have a glass of water? I'm sorry, I'm a bit emotional. How will I find my mom? Where can I find my uncle, my auntie, my first love, my friends? What? I have got no money. I've got no trade. I was 15 years old when they threw me out of school. And now I'm 21 years old and I've got no education. I, nobody needs a saddle maker after the war. How will I be able to ever repay the people who saved my life? Will I be able to ever to hit back those who destroyed six years of my life? A million and millions of thoughts went through my mind. I can't tell you. I can't tell you the, the, that it is so hard to tell what one feels in such a moment. P possibly impossible. And anyway, next morning I put on my knapsack. I dismantled the gun, threw it under a old rug, which I found under the bench where I was sitting and I walked back to, my, to the town where I was born and that's my story. A special thank you to Ivan Jani and the staff at the Jewish Holocaust Museum for letting us film and document the history of World War II. We hope that we have been diligent in our research and we thank everybody for watching.